Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast, episode number 109 of the show. Uh, if you missed episode number 108, uh, it was actually a wonderful interview, uh, author interview I did with Apollo Thorne. You can find it at our uh, website at Liberty po- LitRPGPodcast.com or on our YouTube page. Uh, the YouTube page actually says Geek Wise Podcast, but that's the one I started first. So that's the name I'm kind of semi-stuck with, uh, but you still get all the great shows, reviews, interviews there as well. Uh, so go subscribe there. Um I got Amor Mom here, bringing you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and author interviews. And this week I have seven new Lit RPG reviews just for you folks. I know before we begin, get a quick shout out to Alejandro Amante Romero. <laughs> he became our latest Patreon subscriber uh, for the show. Uh, thank you, uh, Alejandro, for being a, a supporter. You're helping to keep the show free uh, and uh, and free of ads. So that's always great stuff. So thank you, man. Um, the novels that i will be reviewing for you this week include uh absalon's fate a liberty quest uh after that it'll be dante's immortality beginnings then after that it'll be digitized online book one uh then it'll be login accepted in in cipre online book one uh then it'll be visaria online exile lots of online today uh then it'll be back in the game a fantasy liturgy game novel uh the second book in the blood feast series and then it'll be last but not least uh the hobgoblin riot dominion of blades book number two so there we go but before we do that we'll begin the show though with lit rpg news and in lit rpg news we begin with um a interview slash uh, novel narration um, brainstorming session that happened over at Sound Booth Theater Live, um, hosted by, of course, Jeff Hayes and his wonderful crew of narrators. Um, it was a special episode with Dave Wilmarth um, talking about his novel, The Land of the Undying, Dark Elf Chronicles, book number one. I, you know, we talked to him recently as well. Great stuff. Great review. Um that particular episode of Sunbook Theater, very entertaining, which is why I mentioned it. It's a combination of like a mini discussion about the book, uh, but also some live testing of some voices for the audiobook narration. A lot of Sunbook Theater uh, is normally just like audiobook narration. Um, so it's a little entertainment-ish, but also an audience interaction where like the audience can just request certain voices or certain passages read of, an, of a story or something. But this was a, more of a combination of like, oh, mini author interview with the traditional stuff the Samba Theater does, which is like audiobook narration, um, testing, and uh, brainstorming. Um, There's actually some very, very funny scenes when the three narrators uh, (laughs) were together, and especially a very hilarious bit where Laurie Catherine Winkle does an orc impersonation that has everyone laughing uh, their pants off during the thing, so go check it out. We'll have a link in the show notes for you, of course. Subscribe to the Sound of Theater Live on YouTube as well. Um, also, in Little Bridge News, uh, Vasily Mahenko actually released some really cool um, art uh, that I'm not, I'm not sure if he had it commissioned or if someone did it for him, like some um, fan. But it is it's seriously awesome. Like I, I, I'm I, I'm absolutely in love with the two pieces that he released. The first one shows like um, these are the both pieces from like, the first book of the uh, Way the Shaman series. Um, the one of them is like shows the pick with like the um item description it's in russian um but you can still see like the the stats and the numbers and everything um then there's also the rat that they fought in the first book in the series and some of the resources gathered from from that particular thing um really cool black and white well um on not like this parchment looking thing it looks super amazing um also he there's another a second um art that he had commissioner is releasing of man um working in the mine kind of gives you this interesting visualization of of what was there it's definitely a different picture than what i thought in my brain was it looked like uh and so this is very much a cultural perspective you can see in the picture uh, the gold link chain uh some of the rings on his fingers if you look closely enough in the picture uh from the story mahan the jeweler so this is some really interesting stuff as well um go check it out we'll link in the show notes for you to go look at it better in person but like really fun stuff um also um 
Alor and Kong also released some quality work. So this is like a very much an artwork release kind of week uh, for the genre. He, he released some pictures. Um, the one I'm currently looking at in the video version of the podcast. Um, apparently that is his um, very, uh, not very, his sprite companion. It's a dude. I thought it was a chick, uh, but cool stuff still. Uh slightly confused after I realized it was a dude. It was like, it's, I can't remember the name of the character, but it's his main, um, sprite companion. <laughs> um, also there's a picture of a bugbear, um, doing things, the, the, that kind of raid. Uh, and then there's finally a picture of Calder level 12. So all kinds of great artwork that came out from Alaron Kong this week. Um, we'll again link the show notes for you to check it out on their Facebook pages. Um, Dano Shinohofen also released the cover art, uh, for his fifth book in the Alpha World series. It's a very interesting piece. Uh, it, I mean, very good looking, but it's also um, gives you some hints about maybe the storyline. Uh, the name of this particular book is going to be called Fractured Spirit, and the, the cover art definitely gives you that vibe of like, oh, a man of two worlds with like different things conflicting in him. Uh, and a lot of that series is about like these kind of broken characters working through their issues through like memory dives and stuff so um look forward to reading that when it comes out but the artwork is also getting on his facebook page link in the channels for you to go check it out okay uh that's it for a little bit of news um these are now out now the stories that are out now I just haven't read them but there are little bit of stories uh, including cloud dungeon um fairy wonderland it's apparently a uh, a dungeon core dungeon master story so um, also out is Realm of Archon, book number seven, The Mist of Arantia. That's out as well, so go check that out. Uh, also out is The Iron Veil, a little bit of Omni World adventure, as is Frag 13. Uh, that one is out as well. The Way of the Clan, book number eight, World of Valdira. Um, that cover out kind of feels like it's they're phoning it home. Uh, phoning it in at this point that that is actually like the default cover art that i think one of the things that amazon gives um authors for free um i'm used to seeing something slightly more professional maybe it's a maybe it's a hold in or a, it's called a stand in until like the actual cover comes in but that's what's there now uh wade the clan book number eight is out i i'll be honest um this i the series kind of lost me a few books back but if you're into the story and you're loving it uh book number eight is out go enjoy it um, now, in new lit RPG audiobooks, we have a couple ones here as well, including The Liar King, Tower of Babel, book number two is out as an audiobook, uh, written by Adam Elliott, performed by Vikas Adam, so there you go, this is a podium production, so good stuff there. Um, Inside Out, the, uh, we'll review the second book in this series on the podcast today, this is the first book in that series, um, it is out as an audiobook as well, right now, so you can listen to the first one and read the second one. Um, also out as an audiobook is 5D6. This is a um, Caverns and Creatures collection of short stories. If you've ever read the um, other series by Robert Bevan, um, this are the same characters. They're all going it's like a collection, I think, of like five or six different short stories that the author wrote and released individually. And this is kind of the collection of them. Um, some of the story, hit stories are always going to be hit or miss, depending on how you feel about them. But it's a nice, you know, interesting collection. So. Go check that out as an audiobook if you haven't already read the series. Some some of the shirts are really quite funny as well. Okay, uh, now on to upcoming Little PG. This is just where I read off all the stuff that's coming out that I know about. Um, you can feel free to skip it, but there are some new um, additions to this list. Um, Countdown Rally Benders book number one is out on April 23rd. This is a new series from Michael Antimanoff. Uh, also out on the April the 24th is World and Steel, a Pharaoh book number nine. Uh, on April 24th, uh, the author of the series was kind enough to let me know he, he planned a release on April 24th. Apocalypse 2020, Look at the Skies, written by James T. Witherspoon. This is actually the sequel to Apocalypse 2020. This is like that Mad Max Fallout inspired lit RPG story. Got to get it for me. Um, looking forward to reading the second book in that particular series. Um, also out on April the 26th is Vasaria Online, Void. A Liberty Adventure Fantasy, book number two. We're actually reviewing the first book in that series on this particular podcast. Uh, on April the 30th, you're back in game, book number two. It's a collection of short stories from Russian authors that are translated into English. Um, the publishers, um, Magic Jump Books, did let me know that you should read um, 
you should read their book Countdown Reality Benders first before you read the particular short stories in here because one of the short stories is from the sea author and it might be a little spoilery if you read the short story collection first. So there you go, heads up. Um, also, let's see, April 30th, Prison Quest, a sci-fi liberty adventure. I don't know much about it at this point, um, but it says it's Little G. So there you go. Um, on May the 8th, Questmaster, a Little G novella. On May the 10th, My Dear Still is going to be out, becoming Death. Uh, on May the 10th, The Blind Gambit. Uh, this one is new to the list. Um, Harmon Cooper's new um, series called Monster Hunter is going to be out on May the 10th. It was nice enough to pass along some cover art for this as well. So um, looks very interesting. Um, this is actually supposed to be like a really interesting production between Sambu Theater and Harmon Cooper. They're supposed to like introduce like a bunch of uh, original sound uh, music to the audiobook version of the story. So um, I'm kind of looking for t- to see how that collaboration, you know, ends up panning out. Uh, on May the 17th, World of Karnak, book number two. On May the 24th, God Mode, Alter Game, book number three. On May 27th, Kingdom Level 5. On May 28th, Trial by Fire, the second book in the Ureki Online series. On May the 30th, The Dead Rogue. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, that's all the stuff I know that's going to be coming out, folks. On to new releases and reviews. And in new releases and reviews, we're going to begin the show with the review of Absalon's Fate, a lit RPG quest, the Everlands book number one, written by J.D.L. Russell. There we go. Uh, lots of words. Uh, this one is 262 pages, $3.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description of the story. Sean Morrow is desperate to enter the Everlands. A recent release groundbreaking VR game that is all everyone's talking about. He's so desperate that despite being underage, he sneaks into a gaming lounge just for a chance to play. The Everlands has everything he'd hoped for, daring quests, wicked monsters, and more than a few intriguing women. But Morrow is also in danger. For reasons he doesn't understand, the gods of Everlands are in conflict and he's caught in the middle of it. Stuck in the game, Mar has to quickly gain power in order to discover the reason behind the game of the gods and put an end to it before the Everlands are destroyed and Mauro along with them. So there we go. Okay, uh, full disclosure, the author was nice to send me an advanced copy for review. I purchased it once it became available. Um, the opening of this novel is a little... Um, funky uh it's a it's it 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 opens as this kind of uh cyberpunk theme which is a little frustrating to me because i don't really like that kind of um opening or or premise it never really works as far as i've seen in in, in the genre um where the a player is in full immersion and can't let go out the game company apparently can't do anything that help um and send someone into the game to solve the problem for there and that's a very common introduction um when somebody's trying to combine cyberpunk with literary g like creating a problem that can only be solved from within the game. It never really makes sense to me because these are the developers, they have the original code, they programmed it. Um, even if like an AI runs it, they program the AI, uh, hopefully with like restrictions and a bunch of rules and them having overriding access. Um, so that premise never really made sense to me. But thankfully, that's not what this ends up turning about. This is not a cyber um, punk um, like theme story or this... Um, uh, so uh, cyber thriller or anything like that. Um, the theme does continue past the 5%, and instead it just shifts to like this trapped in the game slice of life story where the main character, Mauro, is a teenager. He breaks into a game club to play this hot new over 21 and over game, which is never really explained why it's 21 years and over only, and it only has to be in these gaming lounges. People apparently can't play it at home. Um, but again, once he actually gets into the game, Everything smooths out. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly good introduction into the world once it gets in the game world. Um, the things before that are a little um, rough, we'll say, story-wise, at least for me. Uh, the premise is a little shaky. But again, uh, once he gets in the game, he, it's really slice of life, which is fine. Just to be aware of that's what it is uh, for a lot of the story. He goes on a bunch of adventures, gets some XP levels, explores the kind of build he wants to make. The game mechanics in the story are very open. Um, they, they have like several, uh, interesting aspects and in that everybody has access to mana, spirit, um, health and stamina bars. 
Um, so you, as a player, can draw from any of those sources to to f- either for your spells or your abilities or skills. Um, but mana and spirit are actually also finite resources and that once you spend them, they don't regenerate naturally. So you have to either find um, alternative sources to regenerate them, putting at temples, putting at mana taps, um, or have some special ability to recover them. Um, but I thought it was a really interesting twist on on, on, on that kind of game mechanic, at least. Um, there are some minor, minor themes again. The main character being stuck in the game, but honestly, it's not something that's um, super important to the story. It's some it was someone who was like, "Oh, he's just occasionally reminded, I'm stuck in the game. I should probably be worried about this or something." Um, it becomes something that's more part of the plot, like later in like the th- third or fourth act in the story. But for most of the story, it's just like, "Oh, oh well, I'm stuck in the game. I guess I'll just have fun." That's kind of the main character things um, about the 26% of the Mark story. Um, the story actually gets interesting. It actually develops a plot um, and the main character gets a dark quest to poison the temple of Rav. God, sorry, spoilery um, spoilers. Um, but I, I mentioned that because everything before that, and a lot of the stuff after that is just kind of like this. Okay. Slice of life questing and inventory stuff. But this point at this one dark quest kind of starts like the main plot that I, I think is the most interesting part of the story. Um, unfortunately, it also drops out after that. After that just becomes like, again, the main character doing stuff. Um, he seemingly kind of turns this random questing with an NPC guide who's, whose purpose is ultimately real to be this kind of forced romantic interest. And to me, it feels like her only real purpose there is to pull at your heartstrings near the end of the story. Um, but again, at the 70% mark, that dark storyline quest actually picks up again. Everything after that is actually super engaging and interesting. It's very, it's very well told. But it just feels like to me, you all the stuff in between that point, uh, like really like 26, 27% mark is where that dark storyline is. And then it just kind of disappears and it doesn't reappear until the 70% mark. So all the stuff in between that, um, ultimately kind of feels like feel like they're important like introduction of characters um but it doesn't really feel like it matters because no matter what the main character does even if he's in super danger he's gonna die for some reason he saved a lot like he there's just like these outside forces that just sweep in and save the main character from doom or destruction or from you know losing a quest line or not figuring out you know something and that happens a lot in the story um and it just kind of made like that section between like the 26 and 70 percent mark feel like really unimportant because it the main character's level doesn't matter so it doesn't matter like he that he does quest and that he does do a lot of leveling like the stories in there are they're okay like some of them are really interesting some of them are just like not um but like that ultimately like that leveling section doesn't really have like a huge impact on the story because anytime he's faced with like an overwhelming force, whether they're more leveled or more of them, um, something kind of comes in to save him or he's given the magical artifact of like plot saving or whatever. Right. Um, and that's just kind of what it is. There are, are some cool themes in here. Um, again, after the 70 or mark, everything after that point from 70 per to hundred is really quite engaging. I, I, I said, that's the interesting section. Um, there are themes of like emerging AI, Plots among gods, betrayals, more, lots of good stuff. A lot of it is revealed, though, after the 70% mark. Um, like, in, some good stuff there, including some good twists. Um, however, again, after those places, I kind of fell asleep. And that's kind of not a great sign for the story. Um, and it wasn't just once. I actually tried to read this in two different days because I kept nodding off. <laughs> but, like, in two different occasions on two separate days, in, like, the middle of the day... Um, I fell asleep reading like that section between 27 and like 70%. So it's not, you know, not, not the best sign for me. Like maybe uh, other people would do this a lot more. I know there's some good reviews online for So your mileage may vary. Um, overall though, for me though, I like the, I like that dark storyline because it was interesting. It was something different than just, I'm going to go into quest and get some XP, um, which is, which is like very slice life, which is fine. Um, it, it just that these things were these pop out as being amazing and interesting, and then they went away, and then they came back and like some some marks. Like means like like sixty or seventy percent of the story is just not engaging for me. Like it literally put me to sleep, um, and I can't ignore that as 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 a real like I I liked or like I really liked the last thirty percent, and I'm hoping that that kind of engagement fall, you know bleeds into the next um, book in the series, which I absolutely plan to read, but because most of it kind of literally put me to sleep um i have to give it a five out of ten because 
it was not as engaging as I hoped it was. But go read it for yourself. Go check it out. Um, go read a sample. Hope. Maybe you'll enjoy it a lot more than I will. There we go. Uh, but that's a score of 5 out of 10 for Absalom's Fate. A little RPG quest, the Everlands book number one. There you go. Okay, on to our next review, Dante's Immortality Beginnings. Um, now, this one was actually recommended by Jeff Hayes. He is doing the audiobook narration with Assembly Theater Live um, for, sorry, Assembly Theater, I should say, um, for this particular novel. He's already engaged as the narrator. Um, it's written by Antonio um, Terzini, and um, Jeff says that hopefully the audiobook version of this will be out within the next couple of weeks. Okay, it is uh, 500, sorry, 500, uh, 452 pages. It is $3.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited. It is a, as a purchase or not. It's unfortunately, it's not in KU. And that's because the story is still on the Royal Road. Um, this was originally written again as a Royal Road story. Um, on the Royal Road, it has uh, more than 120 chapters at this point. Uh, by the time you're you know, listening to this podcast, I think it's at technically 119 as of the second. And this novel contains the first 57 chapters of that particular story. They've been edited. They've been um, cleaned up. So this is a, a, a pretty decent version. There's still like an occasional tiny error. Um, but overall, it's, it's, it's much improved over the original version, if you read that. Um, here is the author's description of the story. For those who reside in the outer regions of Valeria, the day of bestowal is what determines their destiny. It is the holy day of the goddess the day that allows those of age to step forward and receive her blessings to embark on the path that she has chosen for them, to receive their classification, which dictates their strength and ability. For those people, the holy, of, holy day of bestowal represents fate itself. For Dante, it represents salvation. Years have passed since he found himself abandoned without memories, fears of hunger, ostracization, and solitude on the streets of Alazel without any hope of reprieve of entrapment at the hands of the creatures that roamed the wild beyond the city walls and that made leaving impossible. Now, there was a chance of everything to change. In a cruel world where power could be gained through slaughter, strength meant everything. For Dante, that meant that the last, that the last his hopes lay in the goddess's blessings. That's what it says. Um, a combat classification would be a lifeline, a way for him to escape the hell he had been living in. Anything else would only mean death. Okay, that's a little extreme of exaggeration, but that definitely is the point of view of the character. That whole novel description um, actually only really encompasses like the first one or two percent of the novel. This is a massive story. It really is. I think the 450 page um, estimation by Amazon is probably off. I, I'm going to say it's more like 530. Um, it really is big. It took like eight straight hours of reading well into the night to finish this thing. And as far as like um, price point per page count, really spot on. Three ninety nine for over you know four hundred fifty pages. Very nicely put. Um, and again, but it is not in Kindle Unlimited. Um, I'd say it's definitely worth a read. Um, but you can also check out a sample on online. You can actually read the um, less polished version there if you want to go check it out there on the Royal Road. Um, this is, I'll, I'll describe it as a action lit RPG story uh, set in a world ruled by RPG mechanics. This is not trapped in the story, trapped in the game or transferred to game world. All of this story is set in a fantasy-ish world with RPG mechanics that the world is ruled by. Um, so it goes in that direction instead. Um, there are some Magical Academy stuff, some political intrigue, and a lot of other interesting things, which I'll get into in the review. Um, but for me, I thought the beginning of this novel was really fantastic. Like, the first 30% is easily, to me, 8 out of 10, just by itself. Um, it, it is a quick introduction to the character, who you, you can absolutely empathize with, um, an antagonist you instantly dislike. It establishes the rules uh, the world and RPG rules very quickly. There's a lot of quick world building uh, that makes this world feel fleshed out. Um, the And the RPG game theory of the main character in the story is really top notch. Like that's the thing that drew me in the most is like the amount of interesting detail for this world and how it incorporates these RPG mechanics into its culture. Um, like as RPG gamers, we'd see classification in the story as like, RPG classes or multi-classing, um, but it's incorporated into this game world. It's like, oh, this this entire religious 
um, and cultural institution where it determines your your place in society and that kind of class class significant warfare like almost this profession system um, and it, it's a it's a very interesting depth to the story as far as it goes and there's a ton of information about each of the classes and I'm not going to spoil like some of the unique things about the story for you um, but it was really fun to see like the main character and uh, reason about what class he's going to choose and what things he's going to think about and, and making the determinations and how he's balancing things and it's just a bunch of really interesting information and there's like a, a ton of depth as far as to the to the information they're giving you about bonuses and and and, and stats and 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 dungeon stuff and like world buildings like, it's, it's really in depth and I think that's the thing that drew me in the most um, at least in the first 30 percent. Um, now, after the 30% mark, it loses me a little bit. Um, it switches to like this magical academy storyline. And again, that's a little bit spoilery, but I think it's important to know that the RPG um, progression thing kind of disappears a bit here from like the 30 to the 70 percentage mark. Um, this middle portion really is mag a magical academy story. Um, it loses like much of that RPG pressure. I think the main character levels once or twice in like something like. Um, what is it, like 400 pages times 40? It's like 160, you know, 200, I don't know, something, whatever it is. Uh, whatever the math phrase that be. But like a pretty big section of the story. Um, but, but on the other side of that, a lot of new injury things, uh, new things are introduced in the story, which a lot of people might really love, which is again why I mention it. Um, things like a ton of political intrigue, uh, magical theory, the main character does actually learn magical theory in here, um, which is separate from like the RPG mechanic system um there's also a ton of like great world building um and again the action still keeps pace even like the, in this magical academy setting it is less than like the first 30 and the last 30 percent of the story but it, like i said it is it's still incorporated in there and there's still tons of like good action stuff like so i want to say that the action of the story is definitely a highlight um which is why it's appealing for, to me i'm definitely an action kind of guy um but after that um 70 mark Again, the story shifts a little bit, and but that RPG progression also does come back a lot. Like you get more, mad, again, more RPG theorizing about how the main character wants to develop his character and his his classifications, um, and and that that returns a lot. There's a lot more like leveling at that point. Um, the end of the story kind of shows off its serial roots in that there is not like a real ending to this. It's more of like a break in the story, and that's and again that's a a consequence of this coming from this serialized story online that's over a hundred, like 120 chapters at this point. And this is just like a, a good break point of the story um, that, that doesn't like lose anything. Like there's a whole new chapter going to open up in book two, of course, um, but it does show kind of its serial roots and that there's no like firm resolution or anything. So if that bothers you as a reader, you know, this, that part may, my maid annoy you. Um, overall, though, I had a really good time reading the story. It really is great. Like I said, I finished it in one sitting. Um, I was literally up until like six in the morning uh, reading it. I started it last night. Uh, it was like a, it was definitely a page turner. Um, action is top notch. Um, the RPG mechanic again blend beautifully with the world building. I really love that incorporation of, of those mechanics in the very culture of this society. Um, I thought it was a great you know twist uh, or a great like, incorporation. Um, I'm not again. Personally, I'm not a big fan of like political intrigue. Um, even I thought like this was done pretty decently well. It's just not my thing in general. But if you love political intrigue, if you if you like that, if you really like that kind of stuff, you're really gonna like this novel. Uh, uh, for me though, uh, I, I still had a good time reading it. Um, for me, it gets a score of seven out of ten. If I was like subscaling it, I definitely say this was like seven point eight. Um, 7.7, 7 7.8, almost, like I said, almost an 8. It's just that a few things in the Magic Academy stuff, the lack of our progression in that section, and the political entry, which just isn't my thing, kind of dropped it down a little bit for me, but there's plenty of people online who just absolutely love this story. And again, uh, it hit top 100 on Amazon um, for, for a bit, um, which is why, you know, Jeff Hayes picked it up as a, as a narrator. Um, uh, so, you know, go check it out. That's a 7 out of 10 for Dante's Immortality, Beginnings, um, there you go. Okay. On to our next review, digitized online book. Number one, uh, there you go. Written by Richard J. Thorne. This one is 294 pages, $3 99 cents. It is available on Kindle unlimited. Uh, here's the author's description. Ivanhoe Darkwolf. He entered the game in a blinding flash of light. He had no memory of who he was, where he came from or why he was there. Where was here anyways? 
All he knew was that he had entered an online game full of magic and wonder and fantastical beasts. Um, But something was wrong. The world that he knew was gone. All the people, his family, loved ones, and everything he'd been shattered and stolen from him. Okay, this is me. That doesn't make sense if he doesn't remember any of them. Just the same. Um, as And he was tasked with saving the last remnants of the human race. But he wasn't alone. In a race against time, Ivanhoe must overcome his fears and battle his way to victory. But the AI had other plans. She didn't know that there, was, that there were any survivors. Not at first. Time is not on his side. Will he fight and die alone? Or will he pull other digitized players into the game to aid him on his quest? There we go. Uh, the author does warn. This is an epic 100k word novel. You will find adult themes, violence, language, stats, and more. So there we go. Um, Parts front wise, um, slightly expensive at 3.99 for like 300 pages, but it's you know appropriate. Also on Kindle Limited. Um, I should warn you though that there's aren't just adult themes in this novel. There are graphic, graphic. Uh, sex scenes in the story. So just be aware of that. If that's not your thing, um, or if you don't feel like skipping them, um, if you can't skip them, just don't need this because there are several of them. Um, so just heads up. Um, this is a fairly decent trapped in the game slice of life story with like AI awareness sub themes. The main character, Ivanhoe, is stuck in the game trying to level up as quickly as possible so he and the other humans that get summoned can fight a rogue AI that's devouring the humans in limbo. Like this is kind of a post post apocalyptic story in that this AI took over, um, as that's destroying the world. And there's like some humans who are caught in limbo. Um, and so she's devouring them slowly. And the main character is trying to pull them out of the limbo to play in the game. But at the same time, he's making her aware slowly that there are survivors. So it's a very interesting mix there. Um, but it's all kind of a, just a good excuse uh, to justify the adventuring and leveling up, which is perfectly fine. Um, the game mechanics are what you expect from a class-based system, kind of restricted. The main character is a hunter that gets in, increases in stats, health, mana as he levels. Every odd level, he gets a new ability um, related to his class. There's a little bit of crafting, but it's not particularly detailed. Um, it's mostly like just collecting stuff. Um, overall, this is a pretty decent against slice of life story. So if, you, if you're okay with that, this is what that is. <laughs> Each quest is almost like this little short story. Some of them are, are, are dull. Some of the short story adventures are entertaining and funny. It's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, towards the end of the story, there's an introduction of an animal companion that op- absolutely is is a highlight of the story. Like it's a super adorable character. Um, and I honestly just wish the shoes and shoes sooner uh, because it would have made the entire story a little more enjoyable. Um, not that it's bad or anything. It's just this character was super funny and interesting um however the graphic sex in the story kind of pulled it just enough from the enjoyment for me at least that it drops into the six out of ten range for me the sections themselves they're decently written they're they're actually longer than some of the quests the main character goes on um but the sex the scenes themselves don't really make sense in context of the story they just feel like they're there for being there, um, which is fine as an author. Like you, you write what you want to write, but for me as a reader, like they don't make sense. Like the main character in the story has a charisma of like something like two or three or whatever, um, but it's really super low. Um, but it seems like every hot NPC wants to have sex with them, like, wants to jump his bones, um, and the first act of a newly awakened player is to have sex with them. Like it really is. Like he summons her, she chooses blue hair, blue eyes, which doesn't match anything with this, like the picture on the cover, by the way. Uh, but um, the first thing she does is just they have she wants to have sex and she's described very often as a sex bond. It kind of feels like that's her only purpose there, besides like later on being like this you know DPS character, um, you know. So it doesn't really make sense in context of like the story itself. Like they really do feel awkwardly inserted. I guess if you <laughs> if you want to hear that from me talking about a sex scene, um, like I said, if you like graphic sex mixed with your size life story, you probably like this more than I did. Um, but for me, you get a six out of 10 doesn't quite hit good, not particularly boring or anything, which is why it's not a five. Um, but like it, it did drop the enjoyment of the story for me a bit. Um, so there you go. That's a six out of 10 for digitized online book number one in that series. So there you go. Okay, on to our next review. Login accepted in Sipari Online, book number one, written by R.J. Triveri. I hope that's what it is, because that's some of those texts are a little weird. Um, here we go. It is a 357 pages, $4.99 that is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. 
In 2049, the singularity has emerged from the depths of the internet, and the world is better for it. Earth has entered a golden age of technology, and man and artificial intelligence share the world in peace. For those that aren't satisfied with the physical humdrum of Earth, the singularities people eagerly welcome humans into their home of Incipre. Uh, but new golden age or not, the world keeps on turning as it always has, and it still isn't always datum and daisies. Just ask Athos Aramis. After being mugged, stabbed, and left with critical spine injury, Athos's last option is to trade one machine-supported life for another and let his mind be downloaded into the world of Incipere. Thanks in part to some outdated guidebooks, his journey is less than ideal, and as the newest alchemist of Incipere, Athos must learn to survive as he goes. His biggest lesson, Incipere and its denizens shouldn't be taken lightly. So there we go. Um, full disclosure, I received an advanced copy of the novel for review, purchased it when it came out. Um, this is a transported to an AI created game world with simplistic crafting mechanics. Uh, the main character, Athos again is dying. I actually think the beginning of the story is really well done. Uh, the main character is dying and he has to qualify for a brain upload to the virtual world created by self-aware artificial intelligences. And again, the author does a really good job of like very efficiently establishing why the main character wants to live in this world, um, while simultaneously creating empathy for the character and doing some world building. Like it really, it's super it's a super tight intro, uh, and it's a really good hook. Uh, the main character is in the game world by the 4% mark. So like, yay, good, good start. Um, now once he's there, he creates a character where, um, it's kind of like this Alice in Wonderland, um, introduction to the game world. He, he kind of wanders about learning about things, seeing like the weird and wonderful things hanging around. And he's constantly surprised by them. Um, like deer with knives and their antlers. Um, and it's kind of the slowest, section of the story but it, it's, it it reveals game mechanics in the world and introduces all the important characters of the story and i don't skip it because again uh, it's actually kind of important because even though it is a little bit slower um all the important people in the story are introduced in this section um so there you go um the pace of the novel picks up at about the 20 20 percent mark of the story when the main character goes in his first dungeon dive all by himself and from there um and actually it's a fairly um it, it, the pace is a little bit quicker, I say. Um, it takes some very interesting turns. There's action, betrayal, failure, player versus player combat, some guild intrigue stuff, some really interesting uh, and good storyline stuff. The game mechanics story are moderately detailed. You can get plenty of information about the main character's class specifically. Um, Alchemist, um, which is, again, described in the novel description. Um, and it eventually changes or modifies, I should say. Uh, but it's an interesting mix. Uh, Data integrity takes the place of health and stamina bars. Uh, so strenuous acts and damage from fighting reduce it. Uh, the main character needs to rest to uh, recompile or use special items to do it. Um, there are ranks instead of levels for players and the native AI inhabitants, but nothing like that for monsters, which I thought was an interesting omission. Um, that combined with the lack of like damage notifications kind of makes it hard to tell how difficult the fight is or how challenging a particular monster is because there's no, there's no reference points for them specifically. And again, small, minor, ripe. Um, crafting and gathering are almost automatic, which is kind of a disappointment for me because Alchemist as a class is very seems to me very crafty, as a, and I'm a huge fan of crafting personally. Um, so it's a little disappointing to see how minimalistic and almost automated it is. There are some cool um, potions that are made, and the way that they were used in combat is very interesting. But again, the actual crafting is you know it's 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 very automatic. Um, let's see other information on classes, monster abilities. Sometimes kind of feel made up on the spot, um, especially towards the end of the story. Um, which is, it's just, it, it is what it is. Um, the only minor again, graphic you're going to have in particular is kind of with the ending a little bit. It's not a bad ending or anything. Um, it's very interesting. Um, but um, if you remember the Lord of the Ring movies, uh, especially the last one in that series, um, the Return of the King, it, it's it's a lot like that. And I, just when you think the story ends, and like there's this big build of resolution, and like, oh, we're going to we're gonna do the thing that's going to save everybody. Um, then there's like five more endings. Uh, and it just kind of felt like it went on a little bit longer than it needed to. So just be aware that if you think like the story is going to end soon, it probably isn't. It's probably going to be like another like four, four or five endings. So just a heads up. Um, overall, though, 
I had a good time reading it. Um, once it got to the action, it, it, like I said, it was very enjoyable and, 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 and engaging. Um, I especially like that not all the problems in the story are resolved by violence. Um, this isn't a straight action story. Like it's not, that's not the emphasis of it, but the action is, is relatively decent. But I do like the fact that, again, not all the stories are solved by action and by murdering. They, I like the fact that some quests or dungeons are act, actually have alternative methods of, of like resolving them. I thought that was nice. Um, for me, I had a good time with it. Again, it gets a score of 7 out of 10. Login accepted in Cipri Online, book number one, I believe. Um, it's going to be out on um, April 20th, which is when most people are going to be watching this. So there we go. There you go. Next one is Visaria Online Exile, a little RPG fantasy adventure written by Riley Morrison. It is 169 pages. It is 99 cents, so beautifully priced. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here is the author's description. Grind. Grind XP and loot in an ancient land of powerful magic, fierce warriors, fire-breathing dragons, deadly monsters and horny demons. Join the noble paladin Ajax and his two companions, one a goth chick named goth chick turned demon mage, and the other a kink-loving succubus with whips and a tail as they journey through the world of Asaria online, getting levels, abilities, and fat loot. Uh, the real world is a frozen wasteland. Humanity is exiled to Viseria Online, living under the game rules of, and the dreaded specter of the now defunct pay to win cash shop. Conscripted into their war between the two Visarian factions, Ajax and his companions must survive the brutal player versus player battles and grow in power and prestige. But as the two factions of the game launch massive simultaneous invasions of one another's lands, a new threat looms on the horizon that threatens to destroy the exiled home of humanity. Now, just a heads up, even though there is a succubus in the story and there is like some like heavy flirting and descriptions of hot chicks, there is no sex in the story. Um, so don't, don't be, don't be turned off by that description where it says, Oh, deadly monsters and horny demons. There's no actual sex acts. Um, I think at most, uh, the main character like kisses somebody and that's kind of it. There's, there's definitely like some, a lot of, there, there's quite a few sex jokes um, and it's like in the window, like language, uh, but there's not actually any sex here. Uh, it's the full disclosure again, receive a demands copy of the novel for review, pretty soon they come available. People send me stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, this story, I got to say, uh, drops you right into the action from the very first pages. Some of it doesn't really make sense, but at least it's a very action-driven story. The first scene of the novel has Ajax, again, the main character, trying to kill a rogue steampunk player, only he ends up being saved by a hot demon mage and her succubus minion. The two go off on some slice-of-life adventuring for a while, and that uh, that not only gets him some XP, but also explores the larger game world and its politics. So, like, good world-building incorporated into their exploration and adventuring. Nice little point. Um, however, all that shifts when they meet a high-level player that claims to have seen a bigger threat to the game world. And again, I'm not going to spoil what that is. Um, but then it turns into like this chosen one story where the main character is picked to unite the kings and save the world. Yay! Um, honestly, it doesn't really work for me as like a, a premise just because it feels forced. I mean, um, and, and they're really specific about it in the novel. Like, you are the chosen one. You're the one who's destined to unite the kingdom and save the world whether you are want to or not um the oracle has told us it's there's that there's very much like this neo oracle vibe thing going on there um and it just me like it's that kind of setup really does like for, to me at least feel like you're forcing your main character down a particular story path um whether he wants to or not um the, the after that there's some power leveling which also again feels forced to the storyline um thankfully there are hints near the end of the story, and again, this is kind of a short story anyways, or a novella, whatever it's called, um, that everything actually isn't going to be pre predestined, and the main character and his team may lose. Um, at least that's what keeps it uh, potentially interesting for me. Um, I, I do plan to read the next book in the series. Um, this one was a little, a, a bit of a miss for me, just because it, it, it kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm it's kind of a pet peeve for me when I feel like a story is, is forcing a character down a particular path for a particular like story purpose. Um, I at least want like the illusion that the main character has agency, uh, that he's making choices, um, 
it's one of those things for me. Um, game mechanic wise, the story has a very strict class based system with limited specialization options. Those are pretty good information about the main characters class and its specializations as a healer, as a middling healer tank. Um, but there's unfortunately a lot less information about the other classes in the world. And the, there's only really mention of like three, maybe four other classes in the entire novel. Uh, so there you go. Um, there's also like this weird, rule in this game world where you have three lives or three reincarnations um and after that you just die permanently and you're stuck in this like weird limo thing where like eventually you'll be hopefully be woken up from stasis it doesn't really make sense and it doesn't really add anything to the story um and it just felt a little awkward um overall though like i said i like the story um a bit more when it was slice of life honestly um it it left me curious about all the things that were being gradually revealed about the game world and the game systems um the chosen one thing just kind of feels like it takes away the mc's agency the main character's agency um there's also like no foreshadowing for like that last twist in the story um so it feels a little bit odd um and hopefully like i said i i think the story has potential as a series um and i hope the stuff in book two kind of pans on and it just feels a little bit less forced. Like the main character is going to be making choices, hopefully um, instead of like being like pushed down this particular path of like saving everybody. Um, so hopefully that's the way it goes for now. Um, this one didn't quite work out for me. as like being particularly good. Again, not boring. Um, just kind of, you know, in between uh, gets score six out of 10 for me. Um, that's about Syria online exile, a little bit of fantasy adventure. With the score of 6 out of 10. There you go. Okay, on to our next review. It is Back in the Game, a fantasy literary RPG game lit novel, Blood Feast, book number two, written by Ellis Michaels. There you go. Okay, this one is 215 pages, $2.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. Here's the author's description. The friends are back. The friends have to get back in the game to help a strange woman they met on the streets of Boston. And they embark on a wild quest full of magic, wonder, and rapping hamsters. That's right, rapping hamsters. That's a crazy tale packed with non-stop action and adventure. You'll meet several new zany characters, encounter strange and powerful new monsters, and follow the friends on a fantastic quest to save a woman whose fate uh, from a fate worse than death. That's an exaggeration. Um, will they complete their mission, or will she be doomed to spend the rest of her life cursed and trapped in the game? Warning, this book contains some adult themes that may not be suitable for everybody. If you can't handle a little sex, drugs, violence, and foul language, this book probably isn't for you. But if you're looking for a fun fantasy lit RPG, you know, I'm not going to read the rest of it. It says, I'll read it stuff. But the, the, the point of the warning is that there is drug use in the story. Uh, and there is mentioning of sex. There's no graphic sex scenes, um, but several of the couples, you know, um, boy girl stuff has, it just says they had sex maybe a couple times in a row. And that's kind of what it is. So it's nothing super graphic. Um, but the, I think the drug use for a lot of people is probably going to be a bigger issue just because that's kind of a you know, no go starter for some people, but I'll get into that in the review. Um, I really actually enjoyed the first book in this series. Um, the one of the most interesting aspects of that particular story was that in addition to like the trapped in the game storyline, um, you also got the perspective of the game characters as, as they were trapped in the human bodies on Earth. It was a fun kind of a reverse transportation to a, a, a new world thing that added a lot of originality to the story. Like in that first story, the basic premise was that um, there are these four people who play this MMO. Um, and they don't realize that their main that their characters and story become self aware. This is a little spoilery, so if you haven't read book one, sorry. Um, just FYI, like premise of book one, like these four characters, the four people, these players are playing this MMO. They don't realize that their characters have become self-aware. They just realize, oh, my character isn't where I left it. Um, and eventually the characters in the game world, in the MMO, find this magical artifact that lets them switch bodies with the players. So it's like this Freaky Friday kind of thing going on. Um, but it's not just a story of like, they show the trap in the game story when the main characters, the players are in the game trying to find a way out and find the magical artifact that lets them switch. But there's also like this really cool part where you get to see the, 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 the avatars in human bodies seeing what our world is like. And I thought that was a really cool part of that story that made it feel different from other art literary stories because you usually don't get that part of the story. It usually focuses on just the players, their action, their adventure, their questing, or XP grinding stuff. But this one gave you the other side of the coin where you got to see like this um, almost stranger in the strange kind of story where these 
characters who are used to living in this fantasy RPG world live in our world and it's hard for them to adjust and they find great things about it like our great junk food uh at the same point they find a lot of scary stuff like modern technology huge cities that span skyscrapers you know uber drivers college campuses that they find it all very mysterious and scary and it was a very interesting kind of um perspective to see this right i thought it was really cool unfortunately that's all gone um like you get a little bit of it like a super tiny bit of it but it it, it, it it's basically gone from this book too um and that's unfortunate to me um instead you follow like the now five friends who go back to the game voluntarily as they try to break the curse plays on that crazy crat lady and that's crat c-r-a-t cat and rat creature she that's what she has um and get her to switch bodies back with the one on earth. It's kind of this really super flimsy premise uh, to get them back into the game. Uh, and much of the early story in this novel feels like it's, it, it's almost exactly like what was in book one, which is again, sort of unfortunate. However, once you get to the 34% mark of the story, um, there's a small scene where the main characters or a couple of them buy legal drugs in the game, like weed or some other stuff. Um, and, Actually, the story starts to feel really kind of original again. Like it, it stops being just this XP grind or this or going places you've already been in the storyline. It's part of the story. Again, that's kind of going to be a no-go place for some people because again, some people just don't like drugs, just like some people don't like sex scenes. And it's just one of those things. But for me, I thought it added a nice bit of fun stoner humor to the story and marks the place where some of the stories in the novel really start. For then you get some, like some exotic new locations, um, some some fun mini stories occur as they're traveling uh, to find the guy who's going to help them. Um, and especially, I I, I personally kind of liked the uh, MC Hamster, the rapping hamster they mention in the in the novel description. Um, super fun character, super funny, funny scene. Um, combat still in the story is not its strong suit. It's just kind of okay. It's very functional. Uh, the humor and the banter between characters, though, if it lands for you, if, if you think they're, if you think these conversations are funny, if you think the humor in the story is funny, it's the highlight of the story. Um, overall, though, I kind of had a decent time reading the story. Um, it, 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 the favorite part of my uh, of book one is gone here, um, and a good part of the uh, the premise in the story just feels forced. Like you're, they want to go back in the game to do this thing and it, and especially the ending of it like it's the ending really does feel forced in that it, it's just kind of a lead into book number three um and it doesn't make sense why it has to happen again a few minor details there um but the funny situational comedy stories um after the stoner shop keep the novel from definitely being anywhere near boring it's definitely not a boring story it's just not as good for me as it was uh, as book one was so it gets a score six out of ten for me book one got a seven out of ten it was really quite funny and interesting enjoyable um even though there were like issues uh, books two um i guess it's missing a lot of the stuff i really love from book one and that's unfortunate uh so for me it gets a score six out of ten that's back in the game oh fantasy little RPG game lit novel blood feast book number two long title uh with the score of six out of ten there you go Okay, on to our last review, The Hobgoblin Riot, a uh, Dominion of Blades, book number two, a little RPG adventure written by Matt Dineman. Great cover art, by the way, like super, super awesome and engaging and action oriented. So good stuff there, Matt. Um, this is 587 pages. It is $3.99. Super good price. Uh, it is also available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, here is the author's description. This ain't your daddy's tower defense. Popper, Jonah, Gretchen, and Alice are back. Uh, Goblin Riot, Dominions of Blades, book number two, a little RPG adventure. Cluster, boot, cluster, and it goes on to describe a vulgar slang noun as like a description. Um, one, it is actually an utterly mismatched situation and undertaking. Two, Popper's scouting mission to Castellane. So it's like, a, it's a fun little way of saying what the novel is going to be. Um, it was supposed to be a simple scouting mission, in and out, no fighting, no new quests, just me, my hippocorn Alice, and a few hired mercenaries. We were going to tiptoe into the spiral, get the info we needed, and leave. You know, the spiral, that tower defense run that protects the Hobblegum capital from invaders. Easy, right? Nobody would have even known we're there. Yeah, so about that. And that's the... <laughs> there's a description of the story um that kind of gives you a really quick uh introduction to like several uh tonal points in the story one 
tons of cursing. Uh, so FYI, like lots and lots of cursing, um, especially when it's coming from like this uh, little girlish character. Uh, so there you go. Um, and also uh, great banter, great cheeky humor. Um, and again, this is not um, a, a normal fantasy little bitty story at all. Like there's a lot of cool, interesting things here. And even it's like the way that the tone of the story is written. Uh, it, it all feels very, sometimes very fresh and interesting. Um, other times it, it gets a little more like um, what you'd expect. Uh, but a lot of it feels like the author is trying to do something different. So, you know, kudos for that. Um, this book is a massive, again, 587 pages, but it all goes by very quickly. Um, it's kind of an, a sign for uh, of an engaging story to me, at least. So, yay. Um, the narrative structure of the story has changed from book one. Uh, this time it's told from multiple perspectives as the team breaks up and goes on their own little quest, or, or just the story is told from the perspectives. Um, each chapter is a note from someone in the group or something recovered as a historical document. It's a really neat way of, of like changing points of views without it feeling awkward and um, even adding like out of game elements to the story. Um, so like really good job, but like, again, making even like the, the format of the story um, a little bit different. So good job, Matt. Um, the novel has all the humor, banter and cursing. You'll likely come to enjoy from book one. If you're reading book two, uh, the story has greatly improved in feeling less forced. And I think this is the biggest improvement for at least me in the story. Like I like book one, but one, uh, I really did. Um, but it got a six out of 10 because a lot of the things that happened in the story just felt like you were, the author was pushing the characters in a particular pathway. And again, that's, it's kind of a pet peeve for me. So it just brought down my enjoyment level, but in book two, I'll, um, there are still a few places that occurs, but it's a lot less. And a lot of the story is just better set up. Like, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, um, the setup for the world is done. Like, um, the character backgrounds are all set up. The larger issues to the game story world are all set up. So the author can kind of just send the characters on these fun, crazy um, stories and quests, you know, uh, and, and, and that allows for a much better narrative structure, at least, at least to me, because you don't have to hide like secrets that you're going to reveal later. or You have to have like stories on a particular path to reveal, you know what I mean? Um, it can just kind of be this kooky, fun, action, adventure kind of story. Um, so, uh, there's still lots of like great story twists and quests in the story. The author's really fond of like those twists in the story. Um, but there is better setup and foreshadowing as well. So those stories twists don't feel out of place or they don't feel forced. I should say for most of the story, there are still a few places, which I'll get into later. Um, on the game mechanic side, there's a lot less focus on individual leveling or leveling up of skills and more on like a larger gameplay mechanics in this case the tower defense stuff um it's a fun um again kind of new game mechanic to pull into a story it incorporates resource management with these actiony battles and i'm gonna get like this tower defense kind of concept where that's how they're they're um the characters are defending this this place they're trying to save and i, I don't want to spoil the story but it, well the tower mechanics totally make sense they're they're in depth there's still your, your abilities to upgrade and move things so to like really cool game stuff uh, the characters still also level, so it's still a little RPG, so don't, don't worry about that. Overall, though, the novel has all the things I liked about book one and almost none of the things I did. So like I said, it's a really good improvement. Um, it was a hard story to put down, and I found myself kind of laughing out loud many, many times. This is a very funny story. If the humor hits, if it lands with you, like you'll probably be like, you, you might have to like change your pants. You might pee your pants. It's, it's that funny sometimes. Um, the story almost gets an eight out of 10 for me. It really does. Um, but some of the tower defense stuff gets a little repetitive um, towards the end. And also that last boss fight, just way, very wand wavy. And I'm like, mm, er, like was almost an eight. It really was. Um, I kind of say this was like a 7.8, uh, 7.7 kind of story. Like it just shy of like, oh, a few things. It's real, so really good. It really is. I was just like, a few things just stopped it from being great for me, at least. Um, like I said, really, really quite entertaining. Um, it gets a score of seven out of 10 for me, but like I said, if I, if I gave like those decimal point things, it would definitely be like 7.7, 7.8, almost, almost a great score. Um, but for me, it's Hobgum and Riot, Dominion of Blades, book number two, a lit RPG adventure with a score of seven out of 10. So there you go. Um, that's it. We're done. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is the show. Thank you very much for hanging out and watching. Um, remember, there, there are plenty of places you can follow the podcast, and it's a great way to support us if you you know follow us and like us there, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Patreon. Patreon supporters get the, actually the podcast a little bit earlier than everyone else because they're 
paying for it. They're paying to support it, I should say. Um, if you enjoy the podcast and I want to support us in any way, shape, or form, you can find out all the ways to do so at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for hanging out with the community. Thank you for <laughs> listening to me go on and on about these stories and this genre that I absolutely love and adore and for, uh, for sharing that with me. And until we can hang out again, remember folks uh, to go read some lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>